how are we going to make this work? This isn't in the contract. Are we going to bring our attorneys into this and, you know, make this a long bureaucratic ordeal? Or are we just going to come to a verbal agreement that benefits everybody? Hey, my name is Felix Tiet, and I'm the host of Shopify Masters, a weekly podcast powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. Each week, we invite entrepreneurs like you to share what they've learned growing successful e-commerce businesses. In this episode, you'll learn how to structure a licensing deal with a bigger brand, why and how to localize a product when you're selling in a different country, and how they use Facebook ads to build a huge list of needs before launching their business. Before our show, I wanted to chat about Shopify shipping. Did you know that you can buy shipping labels for your orders at home and print them with a regular printer, get shipping insurance within the United States, and receive discounted shipping rates with certain carriers with Shopify shipping? There are no additional fees, carrier account, or app required. This is included with your Shopify plan, so check out Shopify shipping today at shopify.com slash ship. Today, I'm joined by Yuri Weinberger from Milky Mama Canada. Milky Mama Canada is Canada's number one rated lactation, cookie, drink, and supplement provider and was started in January 2020 and based out of Toronto and has hit seven figures this year. Welcome, Yuri. Thanks, Felix. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so give us the, the background of the business. So we mentioned earlier that it's Milky Mama Canada. So tell us about this, the, this, this I guess, the, the origins of your particular business in this, this uh, larger brand. Absolutely. So just to set the stage for all the listeners today, there's a distinction between Milky Mama, the brand in USA and Milky Mama Canada. So Milky Mama was founded by Crystal Duhaney out of LA in 2015. She's the owner and founder of Milky Mama, the brand. I've been working with her as an advertising agency since 2017, early 2017. And we started to grow the brand in the USA uh, every month for roughly two years. It's still going today and every month we're breaking records. But um, there was an issue where Canadian mamas were going onto the US site and uh, they were placing orders and really wanted the products. So they said, we sell uh, lactation cookies, lactation drinks and lactation supplements and offer a plethora of uh, lactation support in forms of education, Facebook communities, uh, live chats, Q and A's every week. Uh, and mamas really wanted to buy the product, but the problem it was that number one, shipping rates were very high to ship, uh, cookies from U S to Canada. Number two, the products expire because they're cookies. And if they're held at customs, uh, we couldn't get over the border and then, you know, they could go stale at that point in time. Um, and number three, there isn't really like so much support in Canada right now. Uh, and the currency is huge. If anyone, if there are any Canadian merchants or any international merchants, they know that the American dollar is quite strong and it affects margins and, and, uh, you know, customer facing prices. So, um, myself being involved with Milky Mama in the USA, um, for roughly two years at the point that we decided to expand, uh, decided to go down and pitch, uh, opening up a full operation here in Canada. So I was uniquely positioned because, um, number one, I was the voice to, to an extent, the voice of the brand. I handle all the advertising, which is Facebook advertising, Instagram advertising, uh, Google ads as well, Snapchat at times. Uh, and number two, because my wife, uh, Tally, who's a huge part of Milky Mama Canada, uh, is a nurse a certified breastfeeding specialist and a teacher. So that put us in a unique position to go down to uh, the owner out in the US and say, hey, like, let us start Milky Mama Canada. And so that she agreed, thank God. Uh, and that was back in August of 2018. And since August 2018, fast forwarding up to January 9th, 2020, so about a year and a half, uh, we were trying to figure out how is this going to work, right? Like from my perspective and from our perspective, it's like, how, how do you start a business that already exists in another country and how do you bring it over so it's a win-win situation for the person, uh, like the main owner, right? The main, the, bre- the brand owner, Crystal in the US and Milky Mama. 
And how do we better position that business to be profitable uh, and be more localized for the market up in Canada? And so it took about a year and a half to figure out how are we going to structure this? Uh, are we are we going to start a spin-off brand? Are we going to you know do a licensing deal? Are we going to do a royalty deal? Uh, and both the party, myself and my wife Tally, up in up in Canada, had no experience with this, as well as Milky Mama USA had no experience with this. So it was really um, a good fit, but we had to figure out how we're going to structure it. It took it took about a year and a half. Yeah, and I think um, first of all, this is not an avenue that a lot of people that come on the podcast or that that even listeners look to explore to to license from from a larger brand like a geographic license. Can you go into the now looking back over that year year and a half of decisions that you're making? Any 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 I guess any tips that you you learned throughout this process for anyone else out there that might want to explore this avenue, like how to what to consider when you and what kind of what kind of what what to consider when you are trying to structure a deal like this? Absolutely. So uh, two two main things I would say. The first is have a very strong relationship with the person who you're trying to either license from or franchise from uh, if you're going to go down that route because there's no right or wrong answer and you need to find a balance between um, who who's winning and who's losing and where there's a pull and a push and who's like where the benefit is for one party versus another party, because uh, the idea is that you want to have a win-win situation, but uh, like you have to balance who's making the profit where, right? Uh, so that would be the first thing: is have a very strong relationship with um, with the other party. The second tip I would say is it takes much longer than expected, and have good attorneys. So we actually had to go out and find an attorney um, that would help us with a, a licensing deal. Uh, the U.S. already had one, which was great. And we all worked together as a team because ultimately we want to bring the brand over to another country, in our case, Canada. Uh, but we, we needed to operate at a certain level where pricing can't be too high for customers. There has to be incentive for the original licensor and uh, a, a decent amount of headroom for margin for the licensee. So you need to have good attorneys and definitely a good relationship and give yourself that runway of time to figure out how this is going to work. If you've done it before, you've probably, you know, you have some experience and, and you know what works and what doesn't. I would say our deal is it's very unique in the sense where um, we have a, multiple layers of, of uh, like license fees. So each product line uh, would be, you know, build at a different percentage. Uh, if we we have the opportunity to go out and create our own product, which you know then the U.S. can can use uh, and can introduce into their product line for their audience. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of going on a tangent here, but I, I would like definitely give you those two tips. Mm. Got it. Appreciate that. So you already had a proven business and it sounds like professional relationship already with this, this bigger brand. If someone out there is, it doesn't have this with an existing brand and wants to go in kind of cold, any recommendations how to kind of warm up that relationship first to, to succeed in a, in a pitch or a, a, a request to be a license, to be, to license a, a brand? Sure. Um, I would say be as transparent as possible. If, Go to an accountant, first of all, to make sure that the numbers work. Ask for any sort of financial statements, um, profit and loss statements, balance sheets. Understand what the numbers are on their end. Uh, bring it to an accountant, have it analyzed, figure out if it will work here, especially with the deal. Run some projections and some forecasts with an accountant. Don't just do it yourself like I did. Um, and then I br eventually brought it to an accountant. And surprisingly, my projections were quite accurate. Uh, but... Uh, be transparent, and then when you're going to the, you know, the negotiating table, be, you know, be upfront and be like, this has to work within these parameters, um, and then you kind of set the stage um, to say, hey, like we want this to work, you want this to work. Also, let us, you know, have some ability to help you grow the brand. So let us introduce new products, let us introduce new programs, let us innovate for you, uh, because a licensor, the person who's licensing to you wants to know that you're not just coming in, you know, for the money, you, you have 
the same goals as they have. You really believe in the brand. You really believe in what the brand is trying to accomplish and what they stand for and that you can be a champion for them in that other market, whatever that market may be. Uh, whether that's, you know, a, a new coffee shop, you're opening a new coffee shop, you know, in Nashville instead of Atlanta, or if you're, you know, bringing that business overseas, uh, wherever that may be, the licensor wants to know that you're on the same page and that you are trying to accomplish the same goals that they are. Got it. Now, you mentioned something earlier, which was about how there's like a like localization that, that was required during this process. And in, in, in the more and more kind of global economy that, that we live in, on the surface, that seems odd that you would need a distinction between one country, another, especially between the U.S. and, and Canada. What, what, what had to change? Like when, you, when you think about this, maybe explain to me and the audience, like when you do think about bringing a brand to another country, why, what, what advantages are there that wouldn't exist when you were just a U.S.? based brand that was selling into Canada versus an almost separate entity inside Canada. Got it. So I think that uh, it, it really depends on the business. Uh, what My answer isn't going to apply to every single business. If you're selling apparel or any direct-to-consumer good, uh, it might have a different answer than uh, you know the consumable that we're in. So we were forced to localize. And what I mean by that is it's two-tiered. Number one, uh, our product lines, treats. Treats consist of cookies we sell freshly baked cookies. You can't ship cookies. Um, I mean, you can, we do, but by the time, let's say we went a route where uh, we found a manufacturer, you know, we use the same manufacturer as the US based business. By the time it ships to our warehouse, it may already be a week old and we have a three week shelf life. So by the time that we receive orders from customers and ship it to them, that might be another five days, you know, three to five days, and then they receive their cookies, they're a week and a half old, they're halfway through the shelf life, and that's if everything goes the way that it has to go. So we had to find a bakery here in Canada uh, that can make uh, you know, our cookies to spec. So that's number one. Mm. Uh, number two, labeling requirements, which is really two, two prompt. So going with the treats, which are the cookies, uh, we need to have English and French packaging. right? In the US, you're, I think you're only English only, but in Canada, for any food, if you go to any grocery store, any convenience store, you're buying food, unless it's like freshly packed, um, like, you know, you go to a restaurant, you pick up a wrap to go, uh, you need English and French. And so we needed to find uh, packaging here as well that was English and French. So that's the treat part of it. Now, the supplement and drink part of it, those are herbal based. So they're herbal remedies. They have galactagogues, which are milk making agents within the supplements, within the drinks. Uh, that according to Canadian policies, regulations, laws, et cetera, fall under um, drugs, whereas in the U.S. it falls under food. And because of that, we need a special license from Health Canada, a special, it's called an NPN, a natural product number, in order to place on our packaging that allows us the license to sell in Canada. So we needed to, you know, in the sense, localize it uh, all of our packaging uh, to fall within Canadian rules, laws, regulations, et cetera, uh, with all the governing bodies to ensure that we're above board. So there's that barrier to entry. On top of that, uh, the Canadian uh, Americans think Canadians and Americans are somewhat similar. Uh, I think Canadians think the same until you end up looking at the dollar. So the dollar fluctuates drastically. So one dollar US is a dollar 30 Canadian right now and that's strong for Canada. Could be uh, you know during COVID unfortunately it was up to like 1.46 which is basically you know your dollar is worth one and a half times ours was. Uh, because of that we couldn't be charging US dollars we needed to be charging Canadian dollars. We use Canada Post. Uh, everything we do is Canada based. And that's important for the Canadian consumers, right? Like now you don't have to order from the U.S. in U.S. dollars, uh, pay duties when you're bringing in the product. You know everything is made here in Toronto. Everything falls within regulation. So there really was a very long process of finding the suppliers, finding the right, <clears throat> excuse me, finding the suppliers, finding the right uh, regulations, uh, and, and getting all of our products above board to be within Canadian standards, which we couldn't just say, hey, we're going to drop ship the U.S. products. That would have been great and easy. But that also doesn't allow any incentive for the U.S. to bring us on, right? 
Uh, cause then the U S can just say, Hey, you know what? We're just going to take over the Canadian market. Um, right. but in reality that, that, you know, if you're doing everything above board at scale, especially in food where like liability could be high, you need everything to be within regulations. And that's, uh, you know, being Canadian, being, you know, in Toronto, which is the hub of business of all of Canada, uh, we were uniquely positioned to be able to go out and source all the right resources uh, to figure out how to get us to a place where we're able to launch and not, you know, be in a gray area. Makes sense. There's lots of like, specialization that, that gives you that advantage and logistics and legal. Now, now that you're, you've been live for a bit, you know, a little bit under a year, were there considerations in this agreement that either side hadn't considered until you're further along in the business that you had to revisit? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's, it's very fluid. Um, there are oftentimes, I'll give you some examples. Uh, so there are oftentimes programs that the U S they have a bigger team than us, uh, considerably bigger team because they're considerably bigger business. Uh, so they're able to put together programs, uh, that go live such as, um, weekly Q and A's, uh, giveaways with bigger brands. Uh, now there's a, a scholarship program going on. Uh, uh, it's, it's program run by Crystal Duhaney, who is the owner of Milky Mama in the U S for, uh, any black women who are looking to become IBCLCs, which is an international board certified lactation consultant, which is the highest designation of, uh, any lactation consultancy. Um, and so those are very U S centric and it would be great to offer all of those pro ancillary programs up in Canada. But we aren't, you know, we're a whole different business, right? We have different cash flow, different margins, different resources, different staff members. Uh, so it's very hard uh, to understand, hey, like we can participate in some and not others. So there are always considerations and programs that are going on and, you know, innovations, I would say, uh, that go on on the U.S. side that Canada picks and chooses to participate in just based on our resources. Um, and then there are obviously monetary uh, considerations to be had with that. So those are things that weren't originally in the agreement in which, you know, it goes back to the first tip of having a great relationship with the licensor so that we can understand, say, okay, how are we going to make this work? This isn't in the contract. Are we going to bring our attorneys into this and, you know, make this a long bureaucratic ordeal, or are we just going to come to a verbal agreement that benefits everybody? Um, so to answer your question, yes, there are always considerations. Uh, but we tackle them in a very like in a very positive way, where we're able to you know get on a call, text the owner in the U.S. and understand how do we participate and how are we going to structure it. So that's uh, definitely something to consider. Got it. Now, what about on the other side? What advantages or head starts did you capitalize on that that that, that maybe others can, can consider when they're thinking about it? Should I just start something brand new or look at a licensing deal? Like, what kind of what are some of the big advantages of going with licensing deal that you capitalize on? I'd say there are a lot. I'm going to try and just hit on the most prevalent ones uh, that come to mind. Uh, the first is when you're licensing, you're licensing a brand. So there's a very strong brand in the U.S. That includes, you know, all the brand equity, the brand recognition, uh, obviously the social uh, pages, so the Facebook page, Instagram page, all the all the links that are already existing on, you know, marketplaces and third-party review sites, et cetera. You're kind of capitalizing on that just by, you know, licensing a different brand. You know, you create a different website, you're under the same brand, but you get all the benefit of that because it, you come into new marketplace, nobody hears of you, you start advertising, people start looking it up and boom, you've been around for five, six years. In other cases, it could be 10, 20 years in a different country with phenomenal reviews. The second thing is you get to receive all the products from scratch. There isn't really too much R&D that goes into it. We, we did have a lot. We had a lot of struggles with trying to source here in Canada uh, and it, it's a continuing struggle. But uh, for the most part, like we didn't have to create the formula ourselves. The formula came from the U.S. They gave us an Excel spreadsheet. We signed NDAs with bakeries. We tried to, you know, create the cookies, uh, and we didn't have to do it from scratch. Uh, so that's the second thing. The third is you can basically copy and paste a website with obvious changes to localize to your market. Um, you don't have to create a website from scratch. Fourth thing, 
any sort of marketing, right? You can take all the same marketing materials, all the same user generated content, all the same email flows, Clavio flows. There's a lot that goes into it that you get a benefit from. Uh, you can you can either copy it or you can try and revise it. You can take all the flows that are working, you can analyze them, you can say, okay, where can I improve? What's missing? It, it makes it a lot easier, but at the end of the day, you you end up paying for it, right? You're paying a licensing fee. Um, so you also receive support from, at least we do, I'm not saying in every deal you will, but uh, we receive amazing support from the, from the US team if we ever had product questions on, you know, we, we sell five supplements. Um, what is the main differences between all five of them? Uh, we have all these FAQs that we, that we ask uh, the U.S. Now we understand them, we know them, you know, we embody them. But at the beginning, it could have been slightly complicated. Uh, and we get all the support that we need from them. So there, there mm-hmm. is a lot that goes into it. You, you definitely do have a head start if you're licensing uh, versus starting a brand completely from scratch just because of mm-hmm. you know all the history that's there. Hopefully, it's all positive history, right? Right. So yeah, lots of existing assets that that help you get a quick, quick head start. And it sounded like the bulk of the work coming in was that just how to make this work for the Canadian market from logistics to legal to all the kind of specialization things that you had to discover along the way. Once you had that settled, what are some of the main areas where you started to start venturing out on your own a bit and kind of carving the Milky Mama Canada kind of entity? We do things slightly differently than the U.S. Uh, we take a lot of what works, and to be fair, we share the same social channel. So we don't have a Milky Mama Canada Facebook page versus Instagram profile. They're all the same, so it all comes from Milky Mama. We have different ad accounts. Um, but we do things slightly differently. So our codes are different, our plugins are different, our messaging is slightly different. Our like We offer you know live chats, 24 set, not 24 seven, I'm sorry, nine to five, five days a week, uh, with a certified breastfeeding specialist and a, and a registered nurse. So if you come to our website right now, bottom, right, there's a chat box, you open it, you're talking to a real registered nurse. Who's also a certified breastfeeding specialist who can give you advice as long as you're online and they're online, you get free advice from them. Um, so that's the way that we're carving things out a little bit differently. Our website looks a little bit different. So we started uh, making some changes where we thought that there could be improvement. So for example, on our product pages, uh, our descriptions, they're, they're accordion style with tabs versus on the US site. They now do that from the Canadian site, but uh, they were like longer descriptions. We have little icons saying made in Canada, uh, vegan for our vegan products. Uh, we're peanut free in every facility. The U S isn't, uh, just because of the, you know, the, the partners that we work with. Um, but we definitely have our own feel to it. Our team is different. Uh, customer facing, when you come to the website, they look fairly similar. They're not exactly the same, but if you speak to our team, that's where we differentiate for sure. Got it. Now, one thing that we had looked at when, when we were talking offline was that I went to MilkyMamaCanada.com and because I'm, I'm in the U.S., it redirected me to the to the U.S. site. Does it go the other way too if someone comes to the Milky Mama U.S. site? Absolutely. Great. The reason we did that uh, is because right when we started, right, we start from zero. The, the U.S. has five years of, of SEO history, et cetera. So you could actually go and purchase. If you're in Canada, you could go and purchase from the U S but because we're paying a licensing fee, that's not fair. Right. So, um, every, like we got all that, I guess, quote unquote, I'm air quoting here, free traffic by people Mm -hmm. who are searching, you know, reviews, you know, on a third party review site, they end up on milky dash mama.com, which is the U S site, but they're from Canada. So then they get bounced to Canada. Same thing goes backwards. We have different products, uh, that aren't available. Uh, in the U.S. that are available here in Canada, the ones that we made ourselves. Um, and then, like, that wouldn't be fair if we were selling to the U.S. because, you know, Canadians can't buy from the U.S. So mm-hmm. why should Americans buy from Canada? So right now, it's it's back and forth. We just use, um, you know, on Shopify, we use an app called Address Validator. Uh, sorry, I don't think it's Address Validator. It's uh, Geolizer. Uh, whereas in the U.S., I think they're just, like, embedding it into the code based off of IP. 
Got it. Okay, so now once this this deal was done, what were the first things to do to actually make it a real, you know, I guess quote unquote real business in 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 Canada? Got it. So there are there are two two sides of it. There is the logistical side of the business that took about 18 months. And then there's also the marketing side, right? When you actually start. So there's a, we, we call it, we kind of break it up. It's a pre-launch and a launch. And I actually have a blog post about our, uh, the, stra- the, the full strategy. It's like a 10 minute read, uh, that goes through the entire launch from zero to 250 K in the first three months on the logistical side of things. We were working uh, alongside at the same time as we were putting together the uh, the licensing deal. We were looking for um, uh, manufacturing partners and other partners, such as like the correct customs broker and understanding like an, uh, the natural product number consultant. So we're with Health Canada, uh, and that was a that was a really long process. And just developing the product here, we wanted it to be as as consistent as it is in the US. So like we would go through baking trials, taste them. If we if we didn't approve them, we would have to go through another baking trial. Uh, then we would approve them, then we would send them to the US for approval, and then we would get a, you know, a disapproval. And then, you know, there was back and forth and we worked with three or four bakeries before we found one that actually worked. Uh, that was a huge struggle. Um, so that was the logistical side of things. Also understanding like finding a translator and whatnot. So that was all done before launch. Then there was the marketing side of things for us. Um, so we knew that uh, because I was in the ad account for for years, right? I managed all the ads for Milky Mama USA and I've been doing so since early 2017 or late 2016, I think early 2017. Uh, that we ran like a small test originally and said, okay, like, let's just change the country from USA into Canada and see how people respond. And we look at like cost per content view, cost per add to cart, cost per initiate checkout, cost per purchase. And then we see where the drop off is. And the drop off is obviously because, um, the shipping rates and the shipping times are, are much, you know, worse from USA to Canada. So we said, okay, there's definitely, uh, some demand here, right? I don't see why there wouldn't be. Um, we've tested it out in the U S let's start building a list. And we had tons of time, right? We're talking 18 months between, uh, myself flying down to the U S and pitching coming to Canada and then actually launching. So, um, it took about six months for us to start working with suppliers and, and getting the deals done. Uh, and then we said, uh, I turned to my wife and I said, Hey, like I have a, you know, a target target in mind for the first day when we launch, whenever that is. We don't know when it is. There are so many moving parts. Uh, let's just start building lists now. Because we I've already built out the Shopify site. I did it all myself. I tried to make it as, you know, as consistent as it was in the US. Uh, and so I started building out, you know, campaigns in Facebook to to get leads for when we do launch. Um, and we did that for about 10 months. A very, very small budget, like 10 to $15 a day. It was very sporadic. Uh, we would be on for a month and be like, oh, you know, we spent like, I don't know, like 800 bucks last month. Like, I don't want to advertise anymore. We don't know when we're launching. And we turn it on again and off and on and off for months. Uh, and as we were uh, starting to uh, get a little bit closer to launch and be started to feel a little bit more realistic with the target date, uh, we started scaling up a little bit. Um, and so we used... Uh, Facebook for the most part, alongside some Shopify apps, which we can get into later on, uh, in order to build lists. And we were very intentional and strategic with our messages and what the opt-ins look like, uh, and then what the flows look like after the opt-in. Because if we didn't have a target date, uh, by the time, let's say somebody signed up 10 months ago, by the time we launch, it's possible that they're not breastfeeding anymore. Mm. And so they kind of fall out of that audience. Um, so we were really intentional with that. Uh, once we, we started to understand what the launch date was, we started shifting from, let's say a a list building phase into like a pre-launch phase. Uh, and actually in the blog post, if anybody wants to read it eventually, you know, after this, um, I break up our entire strategy from January 9th, 2020. So we've only been operating for not even seven months at this point. Uh, from January 9th, 2020 up until, uh, today I break it up by, uh, four phases, list building, pre-launch, launch launch weekend, momentum and establishments. 
Uh, and each of those uh, utilized different apps, different types of media, uh, and, and different messaging. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely get that link for me and put it on the, on the, uh, the blog show notes uh, for people to check out. Hey, real quick, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a review on iTunes. Let us know what you think or what you'd like to hear more of. Now, let's get back to the interview. So let's talk about this, this list building. I think um, it's certainly a stage that a lot of people are in or are, are near, which is you mentioned that you were using, sh- using uh, Facebook ads for 10 months, you know, 10 to 15 bucks a day to build up the lead. And you had mentioned that you were very intentional about what the opt-ins look like and the messaging. Can you, get, can you uh, go into more details about that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I hope I don't get too detailed. So I, I break it down. I'll break it down like this. About a year before we launched, so January... 2019, we started our list building phase. Again, we launched in January 2020. So uh, we, again, 10, 15 bucks a day, we used the most simple uh, tool that we could, which was lead ads. So we would run on Facebook, just lead ads using uh, a video that was repurposed from the US. Uh, It was like a PR video by, uh, I think it was CBS, CBS News, uh, covered Milky Mama in 2017. They did like a a minute and a half uh, segments on them. We used that. We said, hey, we're launching in Canada. Uh, Sign up to to know when, you know, when we're actually launching for a special launch offer. And so we would get, you know, on any given day, it could have been as low as 60 cents, again, Canadian dollars, all the way up to $1.20, $1.50. And we would just use interest-based targeting for that. Uh, They would go on the list. They would automatically pull into the Clavio with the integration. Uh, and then we would have a, a Facebook lead ad list for when eventually we did launch, which we didn't know the date yet. The second thing was we had a website pop up. Uh, so the, the the messaging there was special pre-launch offers. Uh, I think we used Pixel Pop at the time to use that, to, to do that. Then we took um, both the lead ads, so all the, all the segments from Clavio of the lead ads and all the segments of people who signed up on the website with the pop up. Uh, and then we created like a blended list. I think I called it like the Clavio master list. Uh, and that was the trigger for the flow that was just like, Hey, thanks for signing up at that point in time. Right. We didn't have any offers. We, you couldn't buy any product. They were on the website. There was no price. We just knew what we were going to launch with. We didn't even know the pricing at the time. Uh, so we sent like a thanks for signing up email. And then we started, uh, to push other things. So what are those other things? Number one, We know that we already have a very large lactation support group on Facebook that is specific to Milky Mama. It's very safe. Uh, You have to prove that you're a new mom, a breastfeeding mom, uh, and it's and it's uh, monitored by uh, admins out in the U.S. that are belong to the to the Milky Mama team. So we would push that. We know that people who are in there are speaking about the product, are speaking in general about uh, support of breastfeeding mothers and struggles and accomplishments, et cetera. And to have people in there who are Canadian, they'll be like, oh, when we launch, like we're super excited about it, right? And then they would eventually purchase from the Canadian site. So we sent an email for that. Uh, We also created a loyalty program using Smile. Um, Not that you could buy anything, but if you signed up, you got, I think, 150 points, which is equivalent to like, I don't know if it was $1.50 or $3. I forget what our uh, structure was like at that point in time. Uh, and then we would also send people to a reviews page, which we had built out because the U.S. has over 10,000, I think at this point, over 20,000 five-star reviews. Uh, so we just, we pulled those and we uploaded them into our onto our store um, because it's the same product. Um, so that's what we were doing. Uh, the whole flow lasted about a week. We were trying to get people who uh, would sign up at any point in time pre-launch like before we even knew, like pre, pre pre-launch really in the list building phase, uh, to just know Milky Mama belong to the ecosystem. Because when we eventually do launch, if you're part of the group, if you're on the pre-launch list and you're already part of uh, our loyalty program, there's no way you're not going to buy. You're super interested. Um, so that was the idea then. I think we spent, um, about $1,500 maybe over those 10 months. So it really was very sporadic. Uh, and then I see here that we got 1,632 leads from paid media and including the pixel pop list, we had 3,581 leads. So it really is like 30 cents a lead. 
Mm, amazing. So once you did launch, I think the next phase was, so you went list building and then pre-launch. What were you doing with the, the list during the, the pre-launch phase? Awesome. So pre-launch was a little bit different because we now had a date in mind, right? We figured out the logistics, we ordered our packaging, we figured out the licensing deal. This was a reality, right? So we knew this about two months before and we, you know, there's lead times for cookies and, you know, we have to get funded, not funding, we're self-funded, but like we have to figure that all out, right? So we said, okay, let's try and launch in like two months or so. What we ended up doing there was uh, we took users one step further. So now the products on the product page had a, had a uh, sign up for pre-order. It wasn't a pre-order in the sense where uh, users would actually pay money. It was just sign up for the list. So we have like four, sk- four different flavors of cookies, five supplements, three drink mixes. Uh, and, you know, we had our descriptions. All, you know, the website was complete. Um, now we would just bring people one step further to sign up for specific products. So first we blasted everyone on our list to say, hey, pre-orders for products are now available. Right. So we got signups there. We changed, uh, we didn't use lead ads anymore. Now we started changing our Facebook campaigns into view content. Uh, no one could purchase anyway. So we just wanted like targeted, uh, quote unquote, cheap clicks to the website so people could sign up for pre-orders. So when we actually, then we can uh, understand like what is the me- demand for the product? What should we order? Like if we only had 10 or $20,000 to spend on inventory, how do we split that up? How many cookies of this flavor? How many drinks of that flavor? How many of these supplements, right? And we could we could say, okay, there's a thousand pre-orders total. What's the percentage breakdown? What's the ratios? Uh, so we were able to make informed decisions like that. Um, and so we were really pushing our reward signups. We were really pushing our Facebook communities even more. And we were really, really pushing product pre-orders. Although again, they weren't real pre-orders. Uh, we used an app called Back in Stock by uh, Swim App, I believe it's called. Um, and we had to finick with it a little bit because it really is a back in stock app. It's not a pre-order app. Uh, but the team at Swim App was pretty good with uh, with like customizing for us. Um, so yeah, we started driving a lot more traffic direct to product page. We changed the homepage banner, so like the hero image. On, on the website to say, hey, sign up for pre-order. Then we would drive that banner specific to a collection. We wanted to move as many cookies as possible because they expire, whereas our other product lines do not. Um, so again, we still like all our advertising is just cookies, cookies, cookies. If you buy something else, that's a bonus for us. Um, and then also the Pixel Pop pop-up was uh, for special pre-launch offers, and then they would go through a flow with the date. Now, I understand that there's a lot going on here, but the idea is to have as much overlap as possible. Because if somebody signs up on the Pixel Pop list, they sign up as a reward member, and then they sign up for pre-order, again, we're more likely to eventually get them on launch day because they're going to be hit on multiple occasions. Uh, so that, so that's the idea. And that's where we really, like, we scaled up there. Um I don't recall what the exact spend was. Um, I'm just referencing the blog post that I have here. So it looks like it was $2,200 spend within those eight weeks. So again, it's it's not like a crazy amount of spend, but it is like you, you need to be somewhat funded, although you could do this at a lower level. Um, and it brought in close to 950 leads, 2,000 pre-orders, uh, 518 new reward members and 339 Facebook community applications. So hundreds, if not, you know, over a thousand people would hopefully convert on that day when we eventually do launch. Got it. So now on, on the launch phase, the launch day, you mentioned $250,000 launch over what, what was the time period? So 250,000 was the first, uh, 10 weeks. So less than a quarter. Launch weekend, I think, was close to twenty five thousand dollars. Awesome. So that was our first day, right? Like mm-hmm. that was our that was I think we launched on a Thursday night. So between Thursday night and really like Sunday, it was about twenty five thousand dollars, which to us was like phenomenal. Yeah. So this is basically all pent up demand from all the all the work that you're doing prior to the launch weekend. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, it's important that that, that I do note 
that we had an offer going. The offer that we had was was a combination between a percentage off, a free gift, and reward points. Again, we we were pushing people to our loyalty program, which, sorry, I keep on saying loyalty. I mean reward program. That's what we call it now. Uh, our reward program had five, 600 people in it. So we were running two times the points there. So for every you know dollar they spend, they got two points instead of one. 15% off the entire store, which is the maximum deal we will ever give on it, you know, on anything. Even Black Friday, we won't give more than 15%. Uh, or I could bite my tongue this Black Friday and give 20%. <laughs> uh, and free gift. The free gift was uh, just a branded like laptop sticker with our with our logo, it was the Milky Mama sticker, uh, which is a gift uh, and a product on our website that we sell uh, for the first 250 purchasers. So we were actually um, we were being bombarded with like, hey, did we get the gift? Did we get the gift? And and we didn't know whether to answer them because if we took we told one person, then everybody would want to know. Uh, so we just said, hey, you'll see a little gift in your you know in your order if you if you qualified, uh, and and that basically added a ton of urgency for people to like go on and purchase right away. Mm. Uh, and so the website, this is really funny. So that website needed to be changed that morning. I worked all day. I woke up before. I was so excited. I woke up at 4 a.m. Right, we were gonna launch at midnight. I woke up at 4 a.m. I'm like, okay, like I'm changing the homepage, I'm changing the banner, I'm getting ready. Right, we're testing with our with our third party logistics company to see uh, if the if the shipment uh, rates, the live rates are coming through. Right, so we're doing all this testing at like 8 a.m. Right, I worked on the website for four hours. I call them first thing in the morning. We're on the phone. Um, as we're te- all these test orders are coming in, we get a real order. Right, even before we launched. Right, like we didn't send mm-hmm. out any email. Like people were waiting. And, uh, yeah, like we got a real order and I'm like, Hey, was that you? And they're like, no, is that you? I'm like, no, I think we just nice. got our first order. The biggest smile on my face yep. took my screenshot, right? Like I deal with over a dozen Shopify stores on a monthly basis on retainer. And like, I got my first own notification and I had the, you know, the biggest smile on my face. Yeah. It becomes, it becomes real at that point. So you, now, during this, those next 10 weeks, you know, the pent up demand you, that you got during that weekend, that makes a lot of sense. So how did you sustain this, this growth from, you know, 25000 to, you know, 10x that to $250,000 over the next, uh, you know, 10 weeks? What was the strategy at that point? It, it differed. So on launch weekend, I'll just go through really quick. We had support from, from paid ads from Facebook, which we only hit our warm audiences that, you know, we took 10 months to build up. We sent out a Clavio email, multiple emails with 3,200 subscribers. Uh, we sent out a Smile Rewards Program email because it was two times the points. And we sent out um, back in stock, which is really like launch emails uh, through the Swim app that I was mentioning earlier. So we were really hitting from all angles and we we scheduled it out multiple times. I think we also had an SMS go out. Um, and that was during launch weekend. That brought us about... 25k probably a little bit less again this is all canadian dollars so you can do the conversion uh but but after launch weekend like that was it right 250 orders went in the first night um and then after that right we just had 15 percent off two times the points uh and then that ended sunday night and so monday morning comes and we're like okay now what (laughs) um but luckily uh i'm i was in the very unique position to have been running Facebook ads, now all paid media really, for Milky Mama in the US since early 2017. So what did I do? I basically copied campaign structures. I wrote all the ad copy, I make all the banners, uh, at least our team at Adjust Media does, uh, which is my other business, don't worry, won't reference that. Um, and then we we basically copied that. So we we rolled out a split between Facebook ads running our, you know, five campaigns total. So a cold campaign for number one and then four different retargeting campaigns. And then the other split was uh, just Google AdWords. But for the most part, there's no brand recognition yet. So you don't gain any traction. Even if you run branded campaigns, it doesn't matter. Lactation Cookies isn't really even a market here in Canada yet. Like there are competitors, but not even close to what we have in the U.S., um, so it's not really an established vertical or product that people are looking at. If you look at the search trends right now and you go back and type in lactation cookies in Canada on Google trends, it's literally at zero until Milky Mama comes into the market and then basically created the market. Now, now there's demand for it. 
Um, so uh, we did have some Google running. Uh, and for the most part, that all got funneled in, right? We sent all this cold traffic now uh, into, into our website where we would capture people with the same sorts of methods that we were doing before. We would capture them via Clavio, right? Via pop-up, put them through a flow, just the general uh, standard uh, standard uh, tactics that every e-com, e-com uh, merchant should have on their website. Uh, but we just tweak them for the Canadian market and make sure that all of the tactics that we're using are, are working very well, right? So our flows are very, like they're not generic, like a man and cart flows. They're not generic opt-in flows. Uh, they're very much like educational surrounding breastfeeding, telling people, Hey, hey we also have a course. If you want to buy it, like a course is very cheap and it's the best course on the market. Uh, join our Facebook community. It's, you know, the largest lactation support community in the world. Right. Um, so, so we're making sure that we're not just pushing product. The ads are obviously pushing product, but when they get to the site, it's not really about product. It's about uh, a whole that we're a lactation support brand. So that was, that was how, you know, we continued our, our ad spend obviously went up as we saw it scale. So I have very specific metrics that I wanted to hit. We blew by them at the beginning. Uh, now we're, we're at those metrics as we scale up, uh, results slightly go down, they diminish a little bit and now we're, you know, we're doing very well. But the way that we continued our momentum was just driving new business all the time because we're a consumable product. You eat two cookies a day, you're done in a week and you got to come back and buy more. So, uh, within the, the, you know, within the first three months, uh, the 250 K that we're mentioning right now, it was very customer acquisition focused with a backend, uh, like backend funnel for, uh, SMS and email of people who didn't purchase in the last, I think it was like 24 days, uh, or 21 days, I'm sorry, uh, to hit them with like, Hey, like re up your supply. So we get this repeat business now we had it even then, but it was all, you know, we, we, the only way to, for us to grow is just to continually acquire customers. Awesome. So what stage would you say you're at now? What is the kind of main focus of the business today? So I'd say that from a marketing perspective, like we're still on like a customer acquisition tear. Like I'm just trying to pump as much money as possible to, to get as many people, um, to uh, like as many eyeballs as possible on our ads, obviously targeted, right? Like we're not just targeting mothers, we're targeting breastfeeding mothers. So we're, we're very unique in that sense. So we're trying to get in front of as many people as possible and then providing them as much value as possible. So again, not just product, but actual education around uh, breastfeeding, uh, support, uh, doing different like flange sizing um, and then like pump fitments, all, all this uh, virtual uh, services that we offer outside of just product. And then people end up buying product, which is great. Uh, the ads are very product based. We're just trying to acquire as many people as possible. I've shifted my mindset from a um, like a, an, an ROI based approach to more of like a lifetime value approach. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest flaw I find right now with Shopify is that I cannot, for the life of me, find the actual LTV, like the average LTV. Like I have to pull like the, the export of the customers and then average everything out. Like it's really a pain and I can't find an app to do it either. So if, you, if anyone has any recommendations, please uh, send them my way. Uh, but we understand that people are buying two times, three times, some are buying, you know, we just got an order yesterday for a 25th order. So they've basically been placing one order wow. a week um, or every two weeks, even close to between a week and every two weeks. So if I can continue getting people for under, let's say $20 Canadian, if they end up buying, you know, six, seven, eight boxes of cookies over the lifespan of their, of, of them breastfeeding and, and being with us and continuing to support us as we support them, then, then why not continue spending money? So I don't really have any budget limits at this point. Um, I'm kind of just looking at like, okay, today we spent this today we made this, is it under, let's say 20% gross profit? If it's under 20% of gross pop, profit, pump more money in. That's the way that I'm looking at it right now, mm. just because I know eventually, like if I had to stop advertising, I would still have some sort of revenue from repeat business. 
Right. That's the that's the the power of knowing your your numbers and your metrics is that you're able to make these kind of decisions that can be scary and daunting if you did not know what would happen if you put a dollar in, what do you get out? So that's that's that makes total sense. So MilkyMamaCanada.com is the website. Now I'll leave you this last question. What's the goal this year? What if if this if you were to hit one thing to make one thing happen, what would you say that is in order for you to feel like this year has been a knockout success? Wow, one thing to isolate. So there are three, and I'll, I'll make it really quick because I know we're okay. at the end here. Number one, we obviously have a, you know a monetary goal that we're looking at, uh, which originally we set, we already passed, and now I've set a second one. So number one, monetary. Number two, uh, we'd like to hire someone internally if we did that to help us support. Right now, it's just myself and my wife Tally. Uh, we're expecting a baby in March, uh, our first one, um, and so we're going to need you know some help internally. Uh, very soon, even. Uh, and number three, if we can get new products and expand our product line, which we've been working on for a long time, um, even our bestseller is not even available yet. If we can get that out before, you know, December, so we're good for at least Christmas, that would be phenomenal. It would be game changing for us. So those are, you know, three little goals one's monetary, one's an internal goal for hiring. And then one's, uh, you know, a, a, a new product development. Awesome. Amazing. Again, MilkyMamaCanada.com. And thank you again so much for coming on and sharing your story and your experience, Yuri. It was my pleasure, Felix. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Shopify Masters, the e-commerce podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs powered by Shopify.